I'm going to introduce you to James. So, uh, hello, James. Hello. <laughs> James Sanders is the Innovation Manager at KIPP Bay Area Schools, and before that, he taught middle school history at KIPP School Los Angeles, where he was one of the first teachers in the world to teach with one-on-one -on -one with Chromebooks in his classroom. So for the past year, James has been working closely with the YouTube EDU team and created a site called YouTube for Teachers, which we'll be talking more about in detail in this presentation, as well as various YouTube EDU-related projects. James is a YouTube star teacher, a Google certified teacher, a member of the EdTech team, and the leader learner for CUE. And for that, I would like to introduce James and have him hit it off. Uh, well, thank you. I'm excited to be here, though. When usually I'm talking to teachers, I get to see their faces and focus in on individuals and stuff. So all those teaching and presentation techniques that we've been talking to our students are um, definitely not applying here. So it's kind of this faceless mass of hundreds of people. And I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. I'm really excited to be uh, talking about YouTube in the classroom, like Britton said. This is something that I've been uh, working on for quite a while. I think as educators, we know that YouTube belongs in the classroom. We've thought about it for years, and we've probably all wondered, why the heck are they not doing it? Well, here it is, and I'm really excited to, to be able to talk about that with you guys today. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, dive into the presentation. So like uh, Britton said, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat, or uh, what do you do, plus me on Google Plus? And, We'll see it and should be able to do that. So I should say, is there any questions beforehand, but you can't raise your hands or just shout out. So we'll go ahead and jump in. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Professor Cobalt here with my star pupil, Olivia. While her classmates use YouTube to watch Justin Bieber videos, Olivia goes straight to YouTube EDU a collection of more than 500,000 free videos from the world's leading educators like PBS, Harvard, Khan Academy, and Sesame Street. Olivia has agreed to share YouTube EDU with you all. But first, we're going to play a quick game. Olivia, the visual aid, please. So that's actually uh, one of the videos that came out recently. It's an interactive quiz that you can go on and take, and it runs you through some of the educational partners available on YouTube, and I definitely would recommend it. But we're going to couch this presentation in terms of uh, like a quiz and go through and, and then see how we did about learning about YouTube EDU. So like Britton said, my name is James. Um, I am a part of the KIPP Area School Team Network. Um, previously, I was down at KIPP LA. Uh, years ago, I did Teach for America down in Los Angeles, and i uh, always been passionate about education. To me, I believe the, uh, the role of the educator in the 21st century is changing. More than anything, I think we need to be curators about designing experiences for our students and pushing them to think critically, collaborate, and have more time in the classroom. If one way we can do that is by leveraging the power of video to offload some of that heavy lifting of needing to get the content to them and we can focus on designing the experiences. I think that's really powerful and so we're going to talk about how we can use video to make your teaching lives a little bit easier and just jump in from there. So I run my entire class. I did teach seventh grade history before this year, um, all from a website. And so the side on here is a left, and one of the buttons on my classroom website is YouTube in the classroom, or history in YouTube. And what I did is I curate playlists of videos that were studying in my class and allow my students to be able to go there, click on it, and have all the different videos that I think pertain to the topic that we're focusing on. Every lesson is set up through the website where I give the students detailed steps of what they need to do that day. And I like to use a lot of video, as you can see in this one on the right. One of them, I've embedded a, a video in the lesson here. So there's a few goals for this presentation. One is that all of you guys around the world watching will be able to leave here, hopefully being able to harness the full power of YouTube to create learning engaging experiences for your environment, for your students. I realize that most teachers are actually teaching right now, so if you're a tech administrator watching, feel free to share this information with them so that they can go ahead and leverage the power of video in their classroom. And the second one is I want to help get the word out there that this is an incredibly powerful resource that teachers and students should have access to in the classroom. So quick rundown of what YouTube EDU is. You saw in the video, but YouTube EDU is hundreds of educational partners, anywhere from Sesame Street to Khan Academy, all the way up to MIT to Berkeley. Hundreds of thousands of videos. 
and all of them are ready to go in the classroom. So why video? Why do we want to use video? Well, video can do things and teach things in different ways that we're not able to do in their own classroom. So for example, if I'm talking to students about number patterns, I might go in and teach it one way, but then you might be able to find videos that present the exact same information, but just in a different way. So the video in the bottom right here is showing how number patterns can be visual, how it lines up with the pyramid. Here on the left side is this project-based environment video that's talking about number patterns and how it might play into somebody building um, setting up an event and arranging different shaped tables and how it would add different numbers. Over here a student might need to see number patterns worked out by a teacher, just pen, paper, explaining it. And video can handle all those needs. So if I taught number patterns in my class one way, I can leverage video to have it presented the exact same information or other different ways. And I think that's really powerful. So when I'm thinking about video on YouTube, I think about two major buckets of video and definitely some overlap. So it's a Venn diagram is a good, a good example of how to present that. Some videos are instructional, some videos engage, and some do both. So on the instructional side, you might have the Khan Academy. A statement of a value, a statement of some kind of Hello, if you could all please mute on your side. Um, we're getting some feedback coming in and we don't want to take it away from James. Thank you. It's up on the upper right-hand side of your screen with the microphone. But then there's other videos that just do engaging stuff. So here's an example of a skateboarder going off a ramp. You might want to use this to introduce some type of physics or math lesson, and it's not doing anything else besides providing a visual anchor or some type of stimulus for the students. But then on YouTube, you're going to find more and more bunches of videos that do both. And this is where I get really excited. So I know you're curious. Here's the typical life cycle of a jellyfish. We've got the first thing, which becomes a larva, which pops the ocean, attaches itself to something, and becomes a polyp, which over time transforms itself into a free-swimming, bell-shaped medusa, a.k.a. jellyfish, with 80 to 90 tentacles. So that video, they've taken great animation. We have somebody engaging, like Hank Green. We're going to talk about his YouTube channel here in a second. And you're able to meet the visual needs and showing them the graphics, but also having some type of engaging dialogue going on. But anytime I talk about YouTube, one of the first things that comes up is privacy. So I taught seventh grade, and all of my students had YouTube channels. However, nobody published their videos publicly. Realistically, all we were using YouTube for was to handle all of our server costs. They were uploading their videos to YouTube privately, adding my teacher email address to me, and I would be able to go in there and view their projects. But it was all private interaction between the students, their families when they were added to it, and me. Another way is having a video unlisted. I record lots of videos for students, and sometimes I'm not really proud of the quality of video that I had. I don't think it's ready to share with the whole world, and so what I'll do is I'll create an unlisted video. So it's on my channel, but you can only see it if you have the direct link. So I can send a link out to Tina Shea or to Harold or to Britt and say, hey, check out this presentation draft I'm working on. Um, if you like it, go ahead and try it out. And so a lot of times I'll put draft and share it with them and they'll see it, but I'm not ready to share it with the world. And the final way I like to do it is just it's public. You know, it's YouTube. You publish it onto the, onto the web and then anybody in the world can then go ahead and see it. So for example, there's a few hundred of us watching this presentation now. I might create a video just for you guys, pop the link into the comments, and only you would be able to see it. And you could share that link with others, but it's not searchable on YouTube. And that's a really handy setting level there. So I'm going to pause for a second and look in the comments. If anybody has any questions or any of our guests listening have a question or have an example or something um, that wants to, to share out. Anybody want to ask any questions on privacy or share anything? Yes, I would like to ask a question. Yeah, the uh, what what I've been I've been doing these uh, on-air hangouts and stuff in Google Docs for a while, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to use Google presentations. Uh, I noticed that the video is a little bit slow and wiggly on there when you do that. The but but the presentations work pretty good. And and uh, how uh, are you using Google presentations for this presentation here? No, for this presentation, I'm just running a, a presentation keynote off of my off of my computer. 
Um, oh, so you're using uh, Apple? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I've, you know, I've had the same thing where I think the video technology is getting better. I just, because I'm going to share maybe 50 videos, 40 videos with you guys, I didn't want to have to have you click load the YouTube app every single time. But um, I know when we're, we're doing on-air shows and stuff, we'll just, you know, share one video or two videos and it works really, really well. That's a great question, though. All right, any other questions? Were there any in the chat on the privacy stuff, Britton? I've been ref I've been refreshing it and I do not see any at the moment. Perfect. That's good because usually the first thing that comes up when I'm talking about YouTube is what about this? What about that? So great. Let's jump into some of the fun stuff. So, all right. So I'm going to talk about the ten most effective ways I found to use video in the classroom. Video has the power to extend the walls of your classroom. Learning no longer needs to require a teacher sitting in a room with the students. With video, you can extend your reach. Also, it's a really nice way to archive all of your hard work, and I'm going to show you an example of a teacher that's doing that. Then the really cool thing with YouTube in particular, and not just any other video site, is you can create interactive videos, and I'm going to show you how those work. Then one of the most obvious examples is hooking and engaging your students through the power of video. I like to desynchronize the learning environment with video, so I call it you know, student-paced learning, and that's kind of the big thing right now in showing you how to do that, and videos roll within that. Um, student and teacher-created videos, we're going to show an example um, from, from one of the Google certified teachers that I think is really awesome. Um, it's a great way to review or for a test or an exam. You can create extension opportunities, we'll talk about that a little bit. A great way to remediate, I know testing is huge in here in the States. And teachers are always looking about looking for ways to more effectively remediate some skills that are going to be coming up on the test. And there's only one teacher, and so we're going to talk about how you can um, create in video environments for students to go through that. And then finally, the big one, um, flipping your classroom and talking about what that's going to look like. So the first one is just extending the walls of your classroom. A couple weeks ago, I was in London, and I was really nervous about handing over my classroom to some other teacher, some other substitute or another staff member at my school. And I didn't want to do that. But because of video, I was able to be the instructional leader every single day in my classroom. So here's a couple of my students, and they might just be sitting in the hallway working on one of the lessons. They'll plug in their headphones, get the material that I wanted to communicate through video, go to the website, see all of the different lesson items they need to go to. And really, the substitute or the person in the classroom is just a tech support or my teaching assistant, I'm the instructional leader. Yes, I created the videos, but because of that platform, I was able to do it from wherever in the world, and that was really nice. Another example is from a friend of mine, Ramsey. And Ramsey runs a website called flipteaching.com, but he uses video in one of the, the coolest, and I think most effective ways in terms of saving time and reaching the biggest audience. So, his students have his access to his email or his phone number and they'll text him a question. And rather than answering that one student's question directly, he'll just pull out his tablet, record a quick video, publish it to his channel, and the students, all students can go on there and see that. So he's, you know, saving himself time every single time he answers one of those questions because obviously, as we know as teachers, if one person has a question, more often than not, other people have that same question. So here's just a quick example of what he does. So in this work example, the reactants are solid potassium and liquid water. We write those on the left. And the products, the things we form, are hydrogen gas, and potassium hydroxide. And the interesting thing, as they said, this potassium hydroxide was dissolved in water. And we know from last unit that means. So before we talk about that, a great question came in, and I think he tried to get in a little bit early from, from Brian. And he said, how do you deal with the potential legal problems associated with your students signing up for Google accounts? Um, what I use is something called Google Apps for EDU. So in my classroom, I have my classroom domain, and all of my students have an email address, but because it's going through Google Apps for EDU, I have granular control over everything that my students are doing. So I can turn on and off YouTube. 
I can decide, okay, no, they can or can't reach, can't receive emails, who they can email, and all of that operates within my domain extension. And so a Google account, I don't know what the age restriction is, but Google Apps for EDU creates a safer environment for elementary all the way up through, through high school. And I think that's a really good question. I just wanted to address that before we moved on. So going back to, to Ramsey, this isn't a video that he's created to broadcast to the whole world. This is a video he's created for several students. When he's doing big production, he does something, a show on education technology called the Infinite Thinking Machine. It's a really high production stuff. But here, it's just a quick record of this, maybe in 10 minutes, up to his channel, and then on to answering another question. The other one is the example of archiving all of your hard work. So a teacher in, uh, at, at the, one of the KIPP schools here was about six months ago teaching still with an overhead projector and transparencies. And one of the most effective teachers in terms of content and, and skills building I don't know, whatever, had amazing test scores. However, every year all of his work was, you know, being lost to the transparency cleaner or whatever. And so we switched over to a tablet. And whenever he's doing the guided practice portion of his lesson or where he's reviewing some important skills, he just hits record on whatever app he's using. And whenever he's finished teaching that part, he hits stop and publishes it to YouTube. So he's not sitting at his computer working on how do I create this really engaging video, He's just hitting record when he's going to explain something important and hitting stop when he's done, and he's going to post it to his channel. And here's an example of his channel, and you can see here it says CW31, CW229. Those are just means classwork on February 16th, classwork February 17th. And then right below in his description, he's talked about what he taught that day. So when it comes time for students to review the test, maybe for Pythagorean theorem, they go to his channel and they find that video. Their aim is that hipsters will be able to find a link of triangles, not hypotenuse, using Pythagorean theorem. Two things in here that we don't already know. One is Pythagorean theorem. The other is um, hypotenuse. But we actually just talked about hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is the longest side of a right triangle. So I mean, these videos are not the type of videos that I want to come across across and discover because they're not terribly engaging, but if he was my math teacher and he has a test coming up on Friday and I know it's going to be on these four subjects, I'm going to go to it and watch it. And if you look at the views here on the right, it's five, six, fifteen, eight views. And so the students that need to review that skill can review that skill. And sometimes I convince him to make it all public for the sake of the world, but before he was just having his videos unlisted and only students in our class could get at it. So that was kind of cool. I'm going to pause for a second, or feel free to have any questions. Go ahead and drop them into the, the comments, and I can pause to go back and try to answer those questions. Have you seen any, uh, Britain, or are we able to move on? Oh, some of the apps we recommend for recording. What I recommend to do uh, for app recording is to go to Ramsey's website, flipteaching.com, and there's a section called Tools. And he's broken it down there in terms of different tools. And then also if you go on to uh, YouTube for Teachers, and we'll talk about that in a second, there's a section on resources and tools is there as well. So those are two websites I want to direct you to. Both have a lot of the same information. And I'll give you a little secret. Ramsey helped us with some of the, the tool selection on YouTube for Teachers. So I definitely want to give him as much credit as possible as well. Are you, right. part, of the, are you part of the EdTech network? The... Which which network room? Well, the EdTech they do they do on air hangouts. The EdTech they're all Google, Google certified teachers, and they do hangouts every Thursday. Uh, yeah, on, you, on you Google mean, teachers. You mean the the EdReach network? Yes. 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 yes, yes. Um, EdReach network on Thursday nights. The EdReach show has the uh, the Google Educast, and on Monday nights we have the Education Cast, which are both on air live hangouts. Yes, and yeah, and thank I've been you for helping out early. Yeah, so yeah, that's they're, they're I think fantastic. I've so I want to talk about interactive videos. So anytime we're talking about YouTube, this is the thing the teachers get most excited about. And I want to show you how it could be done in a really easy way. So let's say, for example, I'm teaching chemical reactions. But I don't want to create four amazing videos on chemical reactions. I'm sure there are great videos on each of the different chemical reactions that you're teaching. So what I did here was I created just a Google presentation slide. And these are just, you know, boxes and text. And I took a picture of it. And then I made a little 30-second video recording of this picture. 
And then within the edit settings on a video, and we can talk about this a little bit more detail later if we have time, you can add annotations on top of each picture so that when a student's watching it, they can click on the picture and it takes them to that video. So I'm going to play it and then I'll try to pull up another website to give you guys an example. Use this video to learn more about the different types of chemical reactions. Click on a chemical reaction and watch the video. If you'd like to view another chemical reaction, simply hit the back button and select another chemical reaction. And, and like I said, that's all that video is. But rather than saying, students, here's four blue links that I want you to click on to learn about chemical reactions, they are embedded within this one video, and it's one place that they can go. And some people say, well, why don't you just give them a list of the four videos you want them to watch? I've heard from several um, YouTube EDU partners who do this, and the click-through rates that they get when the link is actually on the video that they can click on is astronomically higher than if there was just a blue link in the description. So the engagement level goes way up when the student's like, oh my gosh, I can click on the video and take me somewhere else. So I'm going to pull up that example. If somebody else has a question, we can also answer that right now. Tina Shea, do you want to introduce yourself? I know that um, you're visiting here and um, newly minted Google certified teacher. We're going to be talking about one of her great videos here in a second, so I thought this would be a good time to introduce yourself while, while we're waiting for me to pull up that example video. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Tina Shea Blanchett. I teach high school mathematics at John Aird High School. I'm in the New Orleans area, and I've just recently gotten into using YouTube as a tool. I started out earlier this year doing a math rap video with my students for our state technology contest, which we won. Some of you are probably familiar with the um, Westerville South. They've been doing a lot of math videos for a while, and my students were inspired by them. And so we started making our own math rap videos. So it's been a really exciting journey. And we're, I'm actually just mailed off my camera to Westerville South in Ohio so that they can start filming so that we can do our finale video which is going to be a mashup between our two schools. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's going to be uh, something that we talk about a little bit later, but I wanted to give you that chance um, to introduce yourself. She's, she's fantastic. Go ahead. Um, so this is the example of that same video, but it has the annotations over it. So the student clicks play. They're watching the video. Use this video. And then if they click on one of the chemical reactions, it automatically will take them to that next screen with, with a teacher that's far more engaging than myself, who's actually doing the chemical reaction that I wanted to be explained. And so that's a really nice way um, of, of doing that. Okay. So let's see if we can pull up this screen again. There we go. So many windows open. All right, let's dive back in. The next one I want to talk about is being able to engage your students in some type of hook video. If you're going to talk about the digestive system, there's no better video than something like this to start off the lesson. Hey, Ms. Lusk, we're here, and today we are going to talk about thoughts. What are they? How do they define us? And how much weight do we lose every time we fart? Now, it's easy to think that talking about farts is immature, but they are incredibly complicated. And by analyzing them because they're funny, you can accidentally learn a lot of science. Plus, we are in great company. So obviously, talking about parts, that connects greatly into the digestive system. Um, while we were waiting, there was a few questions that did pop in. One of them um, was that students that don't have access to the internet at home. So right now, about 80% of my students have access to the internet at home when I'm teaching. And so I actually don't do a full flip teaching model. I still do stuff that can be accessed offline or online, but I know some teachers that have gone, or schools that have gone to the full video model, they actually create DVDs um, or flash drives of the video files themselves, because if you're creating the videos yourself, which is I think any good flip teaching teacher might be doing, um, they can also just share the video file, but that's definitely something that we need to be working on more as just a country. It's just internet access needs to be just as ubiquitous as power, in my opinion. Another uh, thing about hooking your students into video lessons or videos, videos can take you places where you really can't go in the classroom. This is an incredibly powerful video of these guys descending into the bottom of a volcano. 
and being able to just see that as a student before talking about the little diagrams of what a volcano does and whatnot. I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I like to create student-paced learning environments. So what I'll do is I'll do the direct instruction myself, but in video form, freeing me up to go sit next to a student that needs a little bit of extra help or work with a smaller group of students. And so here's an example of a video I created on the Empire of Ghana or Mali or one of the medieval West African civilizations. Mr. Sanders here, and today we're going to be talking about the Empire of Ghana, located in the western half of Africa. So let's take a look at where we are in time. At this point, West Africa had been using iron tools for close to a thousand years. However, we are a few years before the city of Timbuktu becomes a major center for culture and education. In this video, we're going to be focusing on Ghana from the year 500 up into the early 11th century. The capital of Ghana was actually two separate towns. So this video in all honesty, it does take me a lot of time. And I'll create one video like this maybe once a week. It's, it's a lot of work, and I've seen it pay off in the classroom for my students who get engaged by it. And I also, because I'm heavily involved with YouTube type stuff, I like to be able to share these with the rest of the world. But I understand that the, a teacher is not going to have the time to be able to do this on a daily, day to day basis. So sometimes I get stuck or I get behind, and I'll just take some old presentation that I have, hit play, just like Mr. Boots was doing in his math class and um, create a video in classroom. So I recorded this first period and then I was able to work with second, third, and fourth period um, and they could go through my presentation. So it just creates multiple me's or students can go back and rewind me if they need to. And I think that's pretty cool. And what it looks like in my classroom is this, where um, each of them on their Chromebooks will either be working in a small group applying the information that they've learned on my YouTube channel watching the video or on the lesson channel watching the video for the day um, or working in a small group with me without the technology because I think that's really important. I like to have a lot of Socratic seminars and being able to work with my students in small groups and with 30 kids in the room there's got to be a way to break that up and that's where I can leverage video or le leverage small group instruction. I think that's really powerful. Um, I'm going to pause again and check all the feeds and make sure there's no other questions coming in. Um, Another question is, I think going referring to Ramsey, what does he use to record um, his stuff? You mentioned tablets. So a lot of his recording is actually done on one of these um, Wacom tablets, and I'll unshare my screen here, like one of these tablets and a pen. So he's actually just doing it from his computer. Um, I don't know if he has an Android tablet or an iPad tablet. I know they both um, have great screencasting software. Um, I'm an iPad guy, but I know other teachers that use Android. Um, but So yeah, and then is there any other question? Here comes another one. When you use Google for Education student permission, it will fall under your district policy, which means you can... Um, I don't know. So I've, uh, there's a question about privacy and the age requirements and stuff. Um, I just suggest go to Google and Education and check out the Google Apps free to use stuff. There's a, those are some questions that are definitely above me in my own school system that I can't answer and above me in the, the Google sphere that I can't answer. So, But it's a good question and I hope you find your answer and if not just reach out. Um, Alright, so now my favorite part is talking about student created videos. Um, I, I think it's really important for our students to be creating this day and age and I hate it when people talk about video only as an example of fancy people that give content to students that, that whole model of pouring information into our kids heads and we're just substituting a person in the front of the room with a video now in the front of the room. And that drives me crazy. And I like students being able to do this. So my friend, Mr. Rezac, he's on the uh, Education Cast with us every Monday night. But he set up a channel for some of the students in his district where every week or every semester, I think there's one video a week, they're creating little videos that can be used to hook a student into a science lesson or get them to be thinking. So let's take a look at that. So this is a student created channel. So there's no text here. This hair dryer is blowing this balloon up in the air and it's staying there. And then you have to make a prediction. They're going to bend the hair dryer 
over, if you can't read it, over to one side, slowly, what's going to happen to the balloon when that hair dryer moves? And so you have to make a prediction, and then they do it, and they see that, whoa, even though it's off to the side, the balloon still stays there, and the video stops, and you have to explain why that's happening. And I think that's fantastic. This isn't teacher created, this is student created. And there's nothing more powerful than students teaching other students. And then the other example, and we have our special guest, Tina Shea, here. The out here graphing video that came out this Monday, when we were talking about it on one of the shows that I do, the, the biggest conclusion we came to is what a great way to motivate the staff within a school. I'd love to hear from you about the reaction of the math teacher. So the whole math department and what looks like the whole school came together and created this video talking about graphing of all things and math. And it's, it's fantastic. So I'm just going to play it and we'll talk about it afterwards. So I definitely suggest the uh, screencast isn't doing it justice to go out there and watch it, but um, I would love to hear from Tina Shea. What was, what's was been the effect on your school of having the whole school come together and put something of this caliber um, video out there? Well, um, I guess the oh, main you're muted. thing that, there you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, okay. um, basically, I guess the main thing is that, you know, there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of school spirit. There are a lot of people, you know, I, I think we all have colleagues that usually when you see them, they don't really have much positive to say. And I, I find that it's something that we can all kind of rally around. There's a lot of, you know, I don't think people realize the power of YouTube and how, you know, you can put a video up on the Internet and a few days later, you know, family members are calling you up, telling you that they've seen it. You know, this is really taken off on Facebook. My students have told me that, you know, their parents found out about the video before they did because it was, it's basically all over in terms of, you know, locally. So I think that is definitely something when you can get more people involved, not only can you have people, I guess, interested in the academic aspect of it, but I think more importantly, you can you can show people the power of the internet because a lot of parents, a lot of um, teachers, they don't understand. They think it's just some you know toy that we're playing around with, and they don't get how much power is in creating these videos and putting them online for anyone to see. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think that's such a powerful story, the idea behind creation, I, I, and that's kind of one of the messages I want to get out there, that, you know, when I say YouTube, we think of, you know, passively absorbing video content, but really I'm thinking about it more as a creator and figuring out a way to creatively tell your stories, whether it's something like this and it's a big production, or it's just a simple interactive video on um, something like chemical reactions. You just have this idea of crafting this story, whether it's a big cinematic narrative or it's just a little digital story putting together. It's 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 incredible. Um, so let's go on to the other ways that you can use YouTube. Let me switch back to my screen here. All right. So the next one is just allowing students to dig deeper into the content. So when I'm teaching a subject, let's say for example we're studying West African gold trade. I'm going to create a playlist on the element of gold or something about gold so that when the day ends or they finish the lesson a little bit early, they have something to dig, dig their teeth into and go out there and learn some more. And so they'll click on history, uh, history on YouTube and there will be whatever playlist I want them to look at is there and they can go through all those different videos and it's, it's really cool. So I teach you know, history but there's a lot of science behind gold as well obviously and I would share something like this as part of the playlist. Okay. Okay. And this is from a channel called youtube.com slash periodic videos. It's a story you probably don't see it. So gold is an element, one of the few elements that I think everybody is very familiar with. 
women and many men wear it as a wedding ring. I don't wear a wedding ring because <laughs> as a chemist, I'm frightened that it will react with mercury and go silver and color and will therefore... Um, <laughs> and that guy is great. There's a bunch of videos on his channel, youtube.com slash periodic videos. Um, so that's just a way to extend the learning day of your class because the learning doesn't end when the bell rings. They can go home and they have access to all of my lesson there because it's online and they have access to all this content that they can just explore their interests because you don't know what lessons it's going to be. Yes, it might be teaching medieval Japanese samurais that's going to get them all hooked, but it might be something obscure and you want to have those resources there for them that they can dive into uh, whenever that moment or that light bulb goes off in their head and that's where video becomes incredibly powerful. So the other way is using the, the power of these interactive videos um, to review for exams. So sometimes when I'm doing a simple review for an exam, it might be just a playlist. It might just be like a PowerPoint or a Google presentation where one slide has a question and then you click to the next one and there's the answer, kind of like in flashcards. What I like to do sometimes, and it does take some work, but I think that it pays off, is doing a full interactive experience. So we'll check this out. It's just a question of you who look at the authority within the Catholic Church. Which of the following members of the Catholic Church have the most authority? Would it be A, the priest, B, the cardinal, or C, the archbishop? You decide. All right. And so let's take a look at what this looks like on, on YouTube itself to show you some of the interactivity which is some of the coolest things. So let me switch the screen here. And we are here. Okay. All right. Now let's do some test review where we look at the authority within the Catholic Church. Which of the following members of the Catholic Church have the most authority? Would it be A, the priest, B, the cardinal, or C, the archbishop? And so now you can click on one of these different things and it'll take you to a page telling them whether they're correct or incorrect. So a cardinal doesn't have the more authority over an archbishop, so or the cardinal does have it. That's correct. The cardinal is second only to the Pope. Cardinals are the only people that can elect a new Pope when one dies. Cardinals also And if I got the answer incorrect, it would take me to another screen where it would right. say that's incorrect. You can try again, and it's just this big continuous loop, and that's all done because of the YouTube uh, annotations. So, oops, that's incorrect. And it's my voice the entire time, so my students are hearing from me, and I'm providing them with feedback and correcting that misunderstanding. So when a student doesn't understand that concept, I can be right there to catch them and say, "No, I know what you're thinking. We talked about it in class this way, but just remember." and they can, you know, get that help that they need. So I'm going to pause again and check the feeds to make sure that there's no questions, but I think we're, we're good. Okay. Yeah. James? There is a, another James who wants to know, um, did you create the test review video with pages? or PowerPoint, or something like that? How did you create I, those tests? This test was done videos? with pictures. So I created it in with some of my fancy fonts in Word or Pages, and then I threw it into a, a Google presentation and just took screenshots. And then um, did a, within Google presentation, I did a, uh, some whatever screencasting software I was using. Um, there's just a bunch of uh, different ways of doing it. So whatever your favorite one is, if you have a Mac, um, there's a free screencasting. And so I'll be just talking over it. Um, which is that blank tile here, and then I can add the annotations later. Tina Shea, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I had a quick question. I had typed it on the side. Um, I video. want to know, is this one video that you've done, or is this like they click on something that takes you to a different video? Yeah, it's, it's several videos. In this instance, it's four videos. So you have the initial question video and then the two incorrect answer questions that will loop them back to um, asking the question again at the end, and then the correct answer. So you have to map it out. So if, remember I started this presentation with that big um, YouTube EDU quiz. That map they, was pretty extensive, so you can create these little journeys for the students to take them from video to video, 
and it's pretty powerful. But I'm looking at the time. We're at 9.40, so I'm going to make sure you get to the, the stuff that I'm really excited about, which is YouTube for schools, YouTube for teachers, and some of the great content. So, but thank you for asking. That's a good point to make. So to help, video allows you to help different students that are struggling. You can create different videos or have um, different lesson plans for each individual student. And because it doesn't require you to be there teaching it all the time, you could be using video so you can teach the students that really need that one-on-one -on -one support. So last year in LA, one of the teachers was reviewing for, for the big state test. And so he created four different groups based on their abilities. And so the green group would have three videos of his. And the red group would have a different three videos of his. The yellow group would be working directly with him. And then the blue group would be the advanced group being able to push into some of the new stuff. And all of those would be different tracks that the students could be on with their videos. And it was all done through um, Google Forms. So they're entering in their answers and running scripts in the background, which I think one of the presentations later on in the day is about um, scripts and how you can take Google Forms and have it be self-grading and give the kids feedback um, and a lot of stuff like that. Um, let's see, have you tried incorporating video? Um, I have not, but I know there's ways to doing that. That's the answer to the have you incorporated videos from other learning management systems. No, I only, I only use um, the YouTube. So the last one, uh, last way of using YouTube in the classroom is flipping your classroom. So what that means is at home, they might be watching this video and learning about the digestive system um, and all that new content at home. So that in the classroom the next day, you can actually do the more important stuff, which is the hands-on doing. So here they're learning about the digestive system um, through video. This one's not a teacher-made video. This is some other science channel. But then in class the next day, they're actually doing an experiment, actually taking um, a dissection and pulling out and mapping out the digestive system, which that hands-on learning is what we're getting at. If they were just watching this video in class, I would say you're using video incorrectly for the most part if they weren't doing also the application piece. And then it wouldn't be a presentation on flipping the classroom if I didn't mention um, Khan Academy. So Khan Academy is a, a website with thousands of videos, which are definitely falling into that instructional side of video. And I know some schools either create their own, just like it, or similar type of videos, or leverage the Khan Academy where they'll have those videos as teaching the direct content where, and then the students can come into class the next day and actually be applying some of that information um, that they learn. So I suggest checking that out, checking that out especially if you're a math teacher. Um, so those are the 10 big ways that you can uh, use YouTube in the classroom, in my opinion. And there's more, and I'm learning about more and more um, every day. But because we have 10 minutes left, I want to get into the resources, which are incredibly powerful. Okay. So YouTube for Teachers, like Britton mentioned, this is a site that I got the opportunity to help put together over the summer. Um, what YouTube for Teachers is, is we've started to create playlists of videos that are aligned to the national teaching standards. So for math and English, that's the Common Core standards. For science, it's national science teaching standards, and Common Core will realign it to that when it comes out. And then for history, there is no national history standards, so it's aligned to just general topics in history. And it covers all of the stuff that I talked about here on the ways to use YouTube and then some tips and tricks for getting started and how to start your own channel. But what if YouTube's blocking my school? Well, we created this thing called YouTube for Teachers, or for schools, where it's a web filter that allows your school to access all the content on YouTube EDU which is those hundreds of thousands of videos, and all the rest of YouTube is blocked. But, in my opinion, obviously, having YouTube unblocked is, is the preferred method. Um, but if you have to do, do it through YouTube for schools, you can actually add individual videos to your school's whitelist through the, the YouTube account. So if you know of a school that has it blocked and there's no way we can open up access, I definitely suggest you um, check out this filter and this tool because the content that you're seeing and are about to see it's just, it's almost criminal not to be able to have it in your school. So I, I have a quick question. Locked, and let's talk about some of my favorite channels uh, on YouTube. I have a quick question. Yeah. See, we have a bandwidth problem in our school. That's why we don't use it. So what we're doing, this would be, if, is basically we can download the videos and put them on flash drives and use them in our classrooms that way. What do you think of that suggestion? I think if you created the video, and if it's your own video, then whatever you do with that video is good, like putting on a flash drive. Um, 
I you can't. It's illegal to download somebody else's videos and be sharing it. They put it on YouTube, and I don't think you have permission to download it there. Um, like I said, it's just a, we have the bandwidth issue as well. So what I do is I will show the major video sometimes in the class with one computer rather than having 35 trying to stream a video at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. So the first channel is uh, is SciShow, youtube.com slash SciShow. Let's check this out. Hello, I'm Hank Green, and I'm here to tell you to guard your lights for SciShow, a new show that may change the way that you see your planet, your universe, and maybe even yourself. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to show you all the amazing stuff we have cooking up on our lot. Well, actually, screw it. Just don't tell me when we show you the stuff. In-depth science to feed your brain. Wind power, as you may have guessed by now, all weather on our planet is created by the sun. It behaves like a liquid when you stir it around and dip your so, so SciShow is great. The other one, uh, CGP Grey. I love his content. He comes out with uh, new videos all the time explaining difficult concepts or concepts you didn't know were difficult and showing you how complex they are, like the leap year. A calendar year is made of 365 days, a number that refuses to be divided nicely, which is why we end up with an even months of either 30 or 31 days, except for February, the run to the litter, which gets only 28, except when it gets 29, and then the year is 366 days long. Why does that happen? What kind of crazy universe do we live in where some years are longer than others? To answer this, we need to know just what is a year. Way oversimplifying it, a year is... Okay. Um, the Spangler Effect, which Steve Spangler, famous uh, YouTube scientist, uh, has a new channel, a new show called The Spangler Effect, and it's like an episodic, one episode coming out um, once a week and talking about different science adventures and different stuff. I definitely suggest checking it out. We are going to try to attempt the world's largest physics demonstration or lesson right here at Field. Please welcome the Steve Spangler Science Geyser Team. I promise not to do this at home. I will do it at a friend's home. So that's a fantastic channel. And then I'm going to do a little preview. Minute Physics uh, is, a, is a channel on, on YouTube. And actually, the creator of Minute Physics is hosting uh, an on air hangout in about 10 minutes. And so his channel is taking difficult, complex physics topics and breaking them down into one minute, two minute videos. Um, and they're fantastic. This fall, physicists in Italy published results suggesting that neutrinos travel faster than light, significantly faster. If true, this is really big news in physics. And of course, most scientists are reading the results with skepticism. Why, you might ask? Well, they fly in the face of the well-established and experimentally supported theories of special and general relativity. And extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So let's go visit the opera experiment in Italy. And uh, fantastic. Talks about how why some rocks are flat, some rocks are round, and a lot of stuff that goes above my head. But because of the way he explains it, I'm actually starting to understand some of this stuff. And then the the final one is the one that uh it's a it's new. It's called TED Ed, and something exciting came out uh, this week as well. So TED Ed is a channel created by the creators of TED, where they are looking for teachers, you out there watching this on air hangout. Um, to submit your lessons, because we're all teachers, and we're all creating these lessons, but they're being lost. And the idea is we submit our lesson, and they pair you up with an animator who animates that lesson for you. So let's say you're explaining how small an atom is, which is uh, what one of my friends, John Bergman's video was all about. And they took that video, how small of an atom was, and paired it with an animator, and it's so good. So if you haven't seen it, do a YouTube search for how small is an atom. And it just shows you how powerful visuals are. And I'm really excited about that. What they just announced this week, however, was a way for you to use YouTube videos to create lessons online with them. So I do it all through my blogger account. But what TED has done is they've created this website called ed.ted.com where you can go in there and you can create a little interactive lesson for any YouTube video. So I go to my account, I sign into my TED account, and I click YouTube, and you can find any video on YouTube. It doesn't even have to be a TED video, and you can create a lesson for it and then share it with your students or share it with your fellow teachers. So pause it right here. Here's the examples of some of the TED ones, but if you click this YouTube button up here, 
You can design a lesson, you can ask them questions, and you're going to get the answers to those questions. You can provide them with additional resources. And this tool only came out last week, and it's only going to get better and better as time goes on. So if there's one thing I, you take away from this, one, YouTube belongs in every school, and two, go check out TED-Ed. It's amazing. And finally, and we're just on time, I want to finish with uh, my favorite YouTube video. And of all the videos, yes, this one's my favorite. It's, it's fantastic, and, and uh, soon after this, it's going to be your favorite, too. So let's check it out. I'm on Chick Summons, and I made a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine is a machine that creates a chain reaction, a really complicated one, to make to do a simple task. Um, so... My Rube Goldberg is going to start with this dumb little being knocked down. They're going to fall all the way up here. Okay, then this bowling pin. I'm creating a shockwave, spinning this gyroscope, running down here, pushing the marker top, laying the mini marble button down here, around the spiral, down this ramp. Hitting this switch control power socket. Turning on this toaster. When the toaster's done, this lever will pop up, letting a ball fall out. Knocking all the balls off. Hitting this paper roll, running down here. Hitting this paper towel tube, knocking down. This line of glass with a fishigi ball on top. Fishigi ball. And it's called monster trap. Fall off. And but release the pulley, letting this thing fall on the monster and trapping him. And um, little gobble machines don't don't always work on on the first try. So this is my trick: how much successes and how much failures. I think I think we'll have. This is my hypothesis, and this is the actual. My hypothesis on successes is two. I think it will have 10 to 20. 10 to 20 failures and two successes, but that's, that's my hypothesis. <coughs> I love that clip. It's it's fantastic. So I just wanted to end it there. We're about three minutes early, which is great timing. Um, thank you so much. If you I tweet all the time about some of my favorite videos and share out the YouTube teacher videos of the week, and I'm sharing them all the time uh, on Google Plus as well. So feel free to to follow me there. But um, I just wanted to say thank you for for joining us. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out online. Um, I'm pretty accessible. Um, but yeah.
And I definitely want to thank you, James, for that awesome presentation. I look forward to watching it again online on your YouTube channel. And also, I just want to thank everyone who's joined us today for the Hangout and everybody on the live stream. If you are interested in seeing some more of these videos that are coming up today on this Education on Air conference, remember you can go to sites.google.com slash site slash edu on air. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Harold. Bye.